As the Marines gathered at Hagaruri and prepared for their 11-mile trek to Kotori, Major General Oliver Smith was approached by an Air Force general. The general had flown into the Marines' forward command post to coordinate an aerial Dunkirk, in which 1st Marine Division would be evacuated minus their equipment and weapons. This wasn't the first time Major General Smith had heard such an offer. On November 30th, General Almond had also urged 1st Marine Division's commander to head for the sea immediately, leaving behind anything that would slow them down. Once again, Smith provided both generals with the same answer. We'll fight our way out as Marines, bringing all our weapons and gear with us. On the morning of December 6th, the 1st Marine Division was ready to break out of Hagaruri. Reaching Kotori meant traveling through 10 miles of Chinese-controlled roadway in sub-zero temperatures. We were not equipped for it. We did not have, although I had summer underwear and winter long johns, Marine Corps dungarees, windbreaker trousers on top of my dungarees, and a field jacket on top of my dungaree jacket. I had a calf link imitation fur line parka on and still never got warm in 15 or 16 days there. I honestly thought we was all going to freeze to death. On December 6th, Smith used the 1st Marine Division to spearhead the withdrawal through Kotori along a single narrow supply road that stretched 56 miles back to Ham Hung. If the Marines were going to overcome these daunting conditions, along with the thousands of Chinese soldiers that stood between them and Hong Nam, they would need air support. The commander of 1st Marine Air Wing, Major General Field Harris, devised a cover plan that would see the Marines through to their final destination. Every day, Marine fighters would fly directly over Smith's advancing columns, while Navy and Air Force pilots would provide further support. The Air Force pilots were especially effective at disrupting Chinese reinforcements and supply lines. With their aerial support in place, 1st Marine Division still had to deal with one major obstacle before leaving Hagaruri. East Hill overlooked much of the Marine supply route between Hagaruri and Kotori. Whoever controlled East Hill would also have command over the road south. The task of taking East Hill fell to 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, who had just arrived from Udamni. At 0900, the Marines began their attack. In the Chosin Reservoir Campaign's bloodiest battle, Marines managed to dislodge the Chinese defenders only after 15 hours of non-stop fighting. As midnight approached, however, the Chinese prepared for a massive counterattack to retake the hill. Nightfall meant that Marine air support would have returned to their bases, leaving the Marines atop East Hill completely isolated. Aside from relying on their superior numbers, Chinese soldiers used psychological tactics to defeat their enemies. Well, I did hear bugles and I heard whistles, but with my company, I mostly remember the whistles, that they had a system worked out where they could control their troops by way they blew the whistles. Shortly after midnight, East Hill's crest lit up with gunfire as the Chinese began their attack. Wave after wave of Chinese soldiers crashed into the Marine lines as both sides fought desperately for control of the hill. Despite sustaining heavy casualties, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines held on until the following morning when Marine Corps Corsairs returned to pound the Communist forces. There would be no more counterattacks at East Hill. As daylight revealed the previous night's carnage, Lieutenant Colonel Murray remarked that he saw more enemy dead on East Hill than he had ever seen in any one place before. With East Hill now secure, 1st Marine Division was cleared to begin their arduous journey to Hung Nam. Early on December 7th, the first elements of 1st Marine Division departed from Hagaruri. 
For Major General Oliver Smith, who was traveling by helicopter, the journey to Kotori took only 10 minutes. It would take his Marines nearly a day and a half. The 7th Marines started out, punched the way out of there. And the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, my regiment, or my battalion, followed them. But we didn't get to follow them close by because an airplane had come over, got knocked out, was smoking, had to land. And uh, <clears throat> they decided that the airplane would have to be burned. And it was getting dark around 4.30 or a little after in the afternoon. And they kept my battalion inside the perimeter. And uh, at daylight next morning, the demolition people burned the plane and we started south then. The 5th Marine Regiment followed us south. As the Marines made their way along the snow-covered road, they passed by dozens of wrecked U.S. vehicles, elastic memento to Task Force Drysdale. Chinese soldiers had set up several strong points along the Marines' path in hopes of stalling their advance. On the first 10-mile leg, Smith's 14,000 Marines and infantry fought off four CCF divisions, losing only 100 killed, 500 wounded, and seven missing. As the Marines broke through these barriers in several brief but intense firefights, PLA soldiers changed their tactics. Instead of engaging the Marine riflemen, they would lay low and wait for support troops to provide an easier target. What has happened? We just started shooting at anything to move because we, we had no, really no land because we were trying, we were moving, okay? You, you, got, you set up a defense line when you know what, you, what your, where your enemies are. But when you fight like that, you got to fight and hit anything that moves. Here we are, we had two things, well, th two things against us. First of all, we were low in ammunition, that's number one. Uh, cold weather, number two, and, and Lily cut off from our main source of, of supplies, number three. Okay, supplies coming down to us, when they drop them to us, they were dropping, just dropping it, and, and the Chinese was getting them. So what they done, the only way we get our supplies was, they dropped a, what they call a, a, a dummy a drop. The Chinese went for the, the dummy drop, and then they dropped our supplies again. So they made two drops to us, to, so we can get one. The first one, it was just uh, empty cases and whatever, and let the Chinese go for it, and which they did, and left us uh, uh, to be prepared for the second drop to come down. Despite being attacked almost constantly, the Marines, with 2,300 U.S. Army soldiers, 150 Royal Marines, 40 South Korean policemen, and over 1,000 vehicles arrived in Kotori late on December 8th. During their march, the Marine column had sustained another 616 casualties. General Smith knew that his men would have to continue their advance immediately if there was any chance of reaching the sea. On December 9th, shortly after the Marine column left Kotori, another problem developed. We went down through Kotori, got about a half mile south of Kotori, and we had orders to <coughs> G Company. My, my company went to the right of the road up on top of a peak on top of the hilltop or mountaintop. <coughs> part of my battalion went to the right of the road, part went to the left of the road. And, and uh, I believe we spent two nights on top of that hill. We came off late in the evening, getting ready to go south. We got word after we got on the road, got ready to go, that a bridge had been blown just at the top of the mountain, that we had to go over to the top of the mountain. The Chinese had blown up an important bridge three and a half miles south of Kotori. Faced with a steep drop on one side and a cliff on the other, the Marines could find no acceptable way of bypassing the deep gorge. Without the equipment or time necessary to replace the bridge themselves, Marine engineers would collaborate with the Air Force. After making some quick calculations, Lieutenant Colonel John H. Partridge and his Marine engineers determined they would need four sections of 2,500-pound steel treadway bridge. The following morning, Air Force pilots dropped eight treadway bridge sections over the Marine position. 
Even though the operation was both stressful and time-consuming, the Marines managed to get their entire force across the bridge. The last senior officer to leave Kotori was Chesty Puller. He was followed by a contingent of Marine engineers who set about destroying the bridges that had been so carefully constructed earlier that day. Before 1st Marine Division could reach their next objective at Chinhongni, they would have to pass through the heavily defended Von Chilin Pass. With the Marines making steady progress toward Hongnam, Chinese forces massed to make a last stand to block the breakout. Mao Zedong, the leader of Communist China, ordered General Song Shilun to reinforce the Funchilin Pass with two additional divisions. Located halfway between Koto Ri and Chenghongni, the Funchilin Pass was the last natural barrier before reaching Hongnam. If PLA forces had any chance of stopping the Marines, they would need to do it at Funchilin. When Lieutenant Colonel Donald Schmuck led his battalion of Marines from Chin Hung Ni to clear a path for General Oliver's Marines, he not only discovered that Chinese soldiers had claimed the high ground, but that they also were there in strength. Among Schmuck's men was Captain Robert H. Barrow, a tall Louisianan who would one day become the Marine Corps Commandant. When he was later asked about his first impression of the PLA position at Fun Chilin Pass, Barrow replied, they were clearly in a position to control, dominate, and absolutely stop the 1st Marine Division from moving south. They had to be dislodged. This monumental task would fall to Lieutenant Colonel Schmuck's Marines. General Field Harris ordered his Corsairs to soften up the enemy position for the attacking Leathernecks. Marine pilots flew over the pass's 4,000-foot-high ridgetops, dropping both bombs and napalm. Just when Marine pilots appeared to be on the verge of driving the Chinese divisions out of Funchilin Pass, a violent snowstorm broke out. Faced with howling winds and blinding snowfall, General Harris was forced to call back his Corsairs. The Marine riflemen would have to dislodge the remaining Chinese by themselves. Colonel Chesty Puller ordered his southernmost battalion to lead the charge by clearing Hill 1081. Like with East Hill at Hagaru Ri, Hill 1081 was critical to their success because it dominated the main road and several bridges. If the PLA soldiers were not dislodged quickly, they would be able to pick apart the 1st Marine Division. As Puller's battalion approached Hill 1081 from Koto Ri, two additional Marine companies attacked from the opposite side. For once, the North Korean winter worked in the Marines' favor. Under the cover of snowfall, Captain Barrow's Able Company was able to ascend Hill 1081 undetected and overwhelm a Chinese strongpoint. Recognizing that they were in jeopardy of losing Hill 1081 and Fuchilin Pass with it, the PLA soldiers launched a series of counterattacks to regain their position. The fighting was fierce as both sides fought desperately for control of Hill 1081. In one instance, Chinese infantry rushed a tank and succeeded in killing the crew. Both sides incurred heavy casualties. Many companies saw their numbers shrink drastically. They literally crawled right up in our foxholes. And I had just taken a San Francisco Marine Reserve around to our company's command post. Each of us get two boxes of ammunition. And before we could get back to our machine gun, all hell broke loose. And I could hear foreign language, and I didn't think it was South Korean. <clears throat> and the way it turned out there, we went down to four people, 
from an 18, which is one man extra on a 17 man machine gun section. <clears throat> After Bobby Hallowell got killed, which was five from the last, Merton Good Eagle, a full blooded Pawnee Indian, was evacuated for frozen feet and legs. That left me and two Pennsylvania boys. And the three of us walked out of the Chosen Reservoir from the first machine gun section. Our second machine gun section, I believe, had five men. The, the third machine gun section had seven. And the rifle three platoons was down just comparable to our machine gun sections. So there wasn't a whole lot of us left out of a company of about 227 people. The next day, the weather cleared enough for Marine Corsairs to rejoin the battle. Their presence was felt almost immediately. After several strafing runs atop Hill 1081, the Marine pilots dropped two 265-pound bombs on Chinese bunkers and trenches, allowing Lieutenant Colonel Schmuck's battalion to make their move. With only two operational bunkers remaining, Lieutenant Colonel Schmuck's Marines made their final assault on Hill 1081's final crest. When Chinese soldiers refused to surrender, the Marines unleashed a barrage of grenades and automatic weapons fire. All 530 Chinese defenders were killed during the action. With their victory at Hill 1081, the Marines had stymied the Reds' last attempt to prevent their breakout from Cho Sin. While the ground Marines had fought bravely and weathered extreme conditions, they owed a great debt to their Airedale brothers. In providing close air support for Marines on the ground, pilots risked being shot down by Chinese anti-aircraft fire. Yet in spite of these risks, Marine pilots never backed away from a chance to help their brothers on the ground. General Oliver Smith expressed his indebtedness to the brave Marine pilots in a message to General Field Harris. During the long reaches of the night and in the snowstorms, many a Marine prayed for the coming of day or clearing weather when he knew he would again hear the welcome roar of your planes. Never in its history has Marine aviation given more convincing proof of its indispensable value to ground Marines. Even after clearing the Funchillen Pass, the Marines were left with another obstacle to overcome. As at Koto Ri, Chinese soldiers had blown up the bridge leading out of Funchilin. Once again, the Marine engineers would be called upon to build a treadway bridge. Air Force planes again dropped the bridge's various sections, and engineers quickly went about assembling them. After Marines enlisted the help of Chinese prisoners, the bridge was completed by 3.30 that afternoon. A few hours later, they began the arduous task of moving their vehicles across the chasm. Colonel Chesty Puller was the last senior officer to leave Von Jillen Pass. As his jeep filled with wounded and dead Marines crossed the gorge, Chesty Puller walked on foot. Once the entire division had made it across safely, Chief Warrant Officer Willie Harrison destroyed the bridge. From there, the Marines would have a clear path to Hong Nam. We ate breakfast at the foot of the mountain after walking all night long down this very curvy, roaded mountain. And uh, after we ate breakfast for the mountain, then we started on toward the seacoast. We walked approximately six miles, and an empty convoy from the 3rd Army Division came and picked us up and took us to the railhead. As the weary Marines reached Chin Hung Ni, they were met by transport vehicles to take them directly to Hung Nam. Unfortunately, there was a shortage of vehicles, and many Marines were forced to walk even further. The first elements of 1st Marine Division began arriving at Hung Nam shortly past midnight on December 12th. A few hours later, the breakout was completed successfully. The Marines had suffered 75 more dead, 16 missing, and 256 wounded since they left Koto Ri. For the entire campaign, 
1st Marine Division had suffered a total of 4,400 casualties, with 750 dead and thousands stricken with frostbite. PLA 9th Army Group had paid a high price for attempting to decimate the Marines. Throughout the Chosin Reservoir Campaign, Chinese forces suffered over 37,000 casualties, including 25,000 men killed from battle wounds and cold. While the Marines were temporarily out of harm's way, their journey was far from over. Over the next week, more than 105,000 soldiers, 91,000 Korean refugees, and 17,500 vehicles would be sea-lifted out of Hongnam as UN forces officially left North Korea. By December 15th, over 22,000 Marines had boarded ships sailing for Pusan. We, we went down to uh, Hongnam and got aboard a transport ship. We knew that there was mines still in the water, although we could see a lot of mines that they had just got out to the edge on the land. We knew the water was icy cold. And by the way, the first thing I asked for when I got on the deck of the ship was for a shower. I put my pack that I had confiscated up there in the reservoir. I put it under and my, my rifle. I put it under a stairway that come down from boat deck. That would be my little corner for the night or for as long as I was going to be on the ship. The ship was a transport for 1,500 combat-equipped troops. They put over 7,000 of us on that transport to go down to Pusan, hung down to Pusan. At Pusan, they had a convoy. I believe it was the 7th Marine Regiment Motor Transport. They took us over to uh, Mason, and there we spent three weeks of getting resupplied and retrained, more, more men at you know, to bring in to rebuild our organization. In the United States, Newsweek magazine proclaimed the Chosin Reservoir campaign as America's worst licking since Pearl Harbor. Even though 1st Marine Division had failed to reach the Yalu River, they triumphed in the face of extreme odds, turning sure defeat into victory. General Douglas MacArthur described the Marines' breakout from Chosin as undoubtedly one of the most successful strategic retreats in history, the most successful and satisfying I have ever commanded. Even though General MacArthur celebrated the Marine success at Chosin Reservoir, his grand strategy to defeat the North Koreans by Christmas had failed. Worse still, he had drawn a new enemy into the war, the People's Republic of China. While China could not match America's technological superiority, they possessed a seemingly endless supply of soldiers willing to fight at a moment's notice. In a relatively short period of time, the PLA drove UN forces back across the 38th parallel, initiating a stalemate that would continue for the war's duration. Unsatisfied with President Truman's refusal to escalate the war further, General MacArthur would become increasingly disobedient over the coming months. Even though the bitter fighting in Korea would continue for nearly two years, no engagement would ever come close to matching in courage the Marine struggle at Chosin. <laughs>